So I'm back for another um, talk on Leo Strauss. I'll probably do at least one more. Um, and for this particular one, I want to focus on Strauss's um, distinction between ancient and modern political thought. I touched on it a little bit last time, but we spent quite a bit of time on Strauss and his reputation. But I want to focus in more on some of those specific points that he makes, especially in a couple of books, Natural Right and History, and also What is Political Philosophy. And if you've never read anything by Strauss, I would actually recommend either of these books, but maybe particularly the first chapter of What is Political Philosophy, which is titled the same, because it's a pretty good introduction to the main line of Strauss's political thought, natural right and history would be an elaboration of sorts, almost, of that essay. So I'm not going to try to cover these two books. I'm just pulling out some of the maybe big ideas from these books and trying to give people a sense of how he um, argued and reasoned. Now, to a certain extent, ancient and modern are just shorthand for two different ways of thinking. Um, you can see what Strauss called modern thought to a great extent in ancient thought, though there is a distinction that he makes that's important. Uh, but, for instance, in the Republic, um, Socrates is battling uh, interlocutors who sound in some ways very modern. Uh, guys like Thrasymachus and uh, Glaucon and Adimantus, they all have arguments that sound modern. For instance, Thrasymachus sounds a little bit like Machiavelli, and Glaucon and Adimantus sound a little bit like Hobbes and Locke. They put forth a sort of proto-social contract theory. So even within ancient political thought, there was a knowledge of these arguments that seemed to be to have taken off and become more powerful um, in modern times, such as conventionalism, the idea that morality is nothing but a human invention, um, and that, as a matter of fact, our laws are also human inventions, creations having no natural basis or basis in some sort of eternal truth. Materialism, the idea that um, maybe everything that exists is material, or even more importantly, that all we ought to be concerned about our material things. Um, and of course, moral relativism um, is characteristically modern, but was very much alive and well in the ancient world. And in fact, Socrates often debated with what now would be recognized as moral relativists. Certainly, Callicles in the Gorgias is a quintessential relativist. He, he basically channels the future Nietzsche. If you read that work, you'd be quite amazed um, at how Callicles sounds like Friedrich Nietzsche. So anyway, it would be wrong to say that somehow <clears throat> these so-called modern ideas just cropped up starting around the 16th century. Uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they knew these arguments and they combated these arguments, though as we'll Move, as we move along, we'll see that there is something that makes modern political thought different, even from those precursors in ancient times. But at the moment, uh, what I want to point out is that Socrates and Plato present an alternative to both the modern and the older ancestral or conservative view. That's what makes their philosophy different. At their time, they were not presenting the traditional view. They were, much like the Sophists, going against the traditional view. The traditional ancestral or conservative view was that we ought to worship the gods, that we ought to attend to the ceremonies, that we ought to respect our elders and our ancestors, and pretty much uh, adhere to tradition. That's the way most people live most of the time. And both Sophism uh, in the Republic, that would be represented by Thrasymachus, Glaucon, and Adamantus, um, 
and whatever we want to call Socrates and Plato um, went against, each in their own way, the ancestral or conservative view. Yet Socrates and Plato try to distinguish themselves from these sophists. And this is what intrigued Strauss and which led him to think that he could use ancient political thought to steer a course between modern realism and what we might call the traditional conservative way of life, which is unthinking. Um, and I mean that in a nice way. It, in other words, it's uh, according to custom, tradition, and habit. Now, maybe that's one little way in which Strauss's views or his line of argument uh, moves in a direction that uh, later neoliberalism found more comfortable because neoliberalism, which has come to be known as conservatism in the United States, is it's neither aligned with realism nor is it aligned with ancestral traditional conservatism. And so Strauss tries to find this third way, which, which has to do with the use of reason and seeking truth through the philosophic life. The Enlightenment proponents of liberalism saw, saw their own arguments as highly rational, um, universalistic, um, based upon a notion of what is best for human beings. There are these types of similarities with which we might tie together the Platonic view with, say, the development of classical liberalism, which then kind of has morphed into neoliberalism, which could be connected with, um, with neoconservatism to a certain extent. Um, all of that's kind of a little bit beyond what I could possibly explain or go further with, but I did kind of want to make that connection because it's it's an interesting way that I don't I don't think is the way that the connection between Strauss and neoconservatism actually happened, but could make an interesting <laughs> article that I'm not going to write. So anyway, this Platonic alternative, this path um, that neither goes towards the quote, modern position of realists like Machiavelli, Hobbes, and even Locke, um, nor does it go in the direction of modern traditional conservatism like Edmund Burke's conservatism or Russell Kirk's conservatism, for instance. This platonic alternative to which Strauss was attracted was aligned with reason, with human reason, having the capability to uh, penetrate the depths of human experience. And so it rejected selfism because selfism was, was uh, identified with political rhetoric, with emotive political rhetoric, and with, um, you know, kind of a realistic view of, of the efficacy of, of speech to persuade instead of to convey the truth and elevate people. Plato concluded the sophistic rhetoric and values were not conducive to uh, human health and ultimate happiness. And what I mean by health is not so much physical health as the health of society, um, the ability of people to live peaceably and productively with each other, and furthermore, to develop each other, to help each other develop towards uh, better, better and more contented and more meaningful life. Therefore, sophistic rhetoric and values were not conducive to the ultimate happiness. In, in Plato's thought, the aim is a type of happiness of sorts, but he distinguishes this from what we might call pleasure. And he says, oftentimes people confuse the two, but a person who is truly happy, you might say, is one who is who understands the truth, who knows what is just, and who lives his life accordingly, even if the world spits in his eye, basically. True happiness comes from knowing and not from having power over others. So Plato argued that moral truth can be founded upon reason. Certainly it isn't to be found in superstition or custom. Neither is it to be found in 
sophistic rhetoric. Rather, it can only be found through the philosophic life, through the life of contemplation. And so he asserted that the philosophic life is better than the life of power getting or money making or direct, directionless freedom. Those things um, relate to different types of regimes like uh, democracy um, or even tyranny aim at power getting, um, oligarchies aim at money making, and of course democracy's aim, if there is one, is aimlessness or directionless freedom, which of course begs the question, what kind of government goes with the philosophic or contemplative life? Well, you guessed it, it's the republic, the rule of philosophers. So the upshot of Plato's reasoning is that the best regime possible is a regime that is ruled by reason, that is, ruled by philosophers. And by inference, this means that most real regimes in the real world are not good by comparison. And in fact, democracy is considered by Plato to be the outgrowth of failed oligarchy, which in and of itself is a failed regime. But there's something else in store for democracy. And I'll get back to that a bit at the end of this video. But here I'll just say that the idea that the best regime is ruled by reason, which is basically, that is, the best regime is basically aristocratic in nature, that idea is both anti-authoritarian and anti-democratic. It's anti-authoritarian because it's against the assertion of power simply because you have it. It's against giving that legitimacy. But it's also anti-democratic because, of course, at least in Plato's mind, only a very few people had the philosophic ability to actually rule. Only, the ver only a very few people were qualified. So that, of course, means that the many are not fit to rule. So, and just to kind of... Um, address the tie to neoconservatism again. If neoconservatives believed that spreading democracy around the world was good, Plato certainly would not have agreed because democracy was not a good regime or a just regime in his view. And so spreading democracy could not be an absolute good. It might be a relative good, you know, depending on what else was out there. Um, but to be very, um, to believe that democracy could cure all the ills um, that we suffer from, that is not a thought that would have come naturally to Plato. And inasmuch as Strauss follows the Platonic um, line of reasoning, uh, he would not have thought so either. Now I just want to talk a little bit about um, the comparison between ancients and moderns from Strauss's perspective. Uh, the first point of comparison to make is that Strauss thought that for Plato and Aristotle, man is a political animal. And what that meant was for the ancient thinkers, human beings were naturally social and naturally political. He said man is related to family, tribe, neighborhood, and community. And politics is natural for human beings. Now you might think, well, how could anybody argue with that? It certainly seems like man is a political animal. And usually he's using politics to mess things up pretty royally. Um, but that's why we have to contrast this idea with what the modern political thinkers said. Um, and we're talking again about Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke. For the moderns, they saw the individual as prior to society. What that means is that they did not think that, that social behavior um, or political behavior came naturally to human beings, but rather those things are creations of human beings to fulfill certain needs. So individuals literally naturally uh, live uh, without a strong desire for society and definitely not for political involvement. Now, Machiavelli is kind of an interesting liminal character because he still believed that, you, that people took pleasure from glory and a feeling of power um, and that they enjoyed politics. And actually Hobbes, in a way, also acknowledges this. 
um, that it's it's just something that he wants to snuff out. You know, like he thinks it's some sort of irrational malady that people want glory and power. And he presents a rational alternative. Anyway, I don't want to get into the weeds too much there, but let's just say the modern philosophers for Strauss tend to see politics as an artificial imposition on our natural freedom. You can take Rousseau, for instance, in this regard. You know, in our natural state, we're kind of wandering around in a blissful, you know, field somewhere, enjoying the sweetness of our own existence. And then actually, in Rousseau's opinion, um, society forms in a sort of accidental way and imposes itself on our freedom and takes away uh, much of our joy. But, you know, for Hobbes and Locke, the social contract that people made with each other to form a government was a good thing, not not some terrible crisis, um, because it provided order and stability that people could use in order to begin to you know build on that scaffolding, their economic growth and their you know their their safety um, for their for their nation. But notice the fundamental difference. For the ancients, if man is a political animal, then his fulfillment is going to come only if he engages in political activity. So only if he's a full member of his community, if he's a citizen, is he going to be able to um, you know really actualize himself to use modern parlance. Whereas for the moderns, there's this shrinkage of what it means to be human in Strauss's view that he that he points out in these books sort of circumscribing of humanity to much more basic things you know so for instance Hobbes the last thing he wanted was active citizens he wanted good uh, obedient citizens more like subjects you know who mainly kept their heads down and engaged in uh, useful economic activity um, and even Locke you know uh, famous for kind of supplying some of the ideas behind the American founding, very much wanted peaceable citizens who were mainly involved in their in commerce um, and not in political wranglings. That was considered dangerous. So there's this huge difference. Do you feel fulfilled um, only if you can go to your town hall meeting or you can go to, you know, you can somehow take active role in your community or not you know most people are so far away from experiencing that level of um, uh, of participation that they don't know today at the most most people vote and and at well actually most people don't vote as we know so there's not that much experience to draw from to find out but this is a big big distinction between the two and then another distinction that Strauss points out is that for the ancients government should foster virtue, meaning that it was government's business to get involved in your character. There was a reason for that. They thought that only the few could become virtuous and just on their own. Um, and those few were the philosophers who could think their way there, who could understand um, why it is best to live one's life moderately, and um, to do justice to others and to seek the truth and all of that. Most people aren't philosophers and they need good government. Good government was defined as trying to make, you know, the citizens as virtuous as possible through good laws and good leadership. So again, you see a little bit of what might be called elitism coming out here um, in that most people are not capable of self-regulating. They need to have good government. Now, now think about how offensive that notion would be to the average American, right? Um, the idea that government should be involved in making us virtuous, that somehow its laws should be shaping our character. Of course, they do um, inevitably shape our character one way or the other, whether they intend to or not. And that's something that most people don't want to admit in a, in a liberal regime, that the laws and the, the form of government and the behavior of our leaders shape our character. The moderns engaged in this, I guess what I think of as kind of a myth, that government should stay out of the virtue business and just provide the safety 
and the liberty that we need to be able to go about our private business and which cannot be obtained in nature by us individually nearly as well as government could do it. As though government could possibly stay out of the virtue business. Think about all the ways that our modern government gets involved in our private lives and defining what we can do and what we can't do and what kind of what kind of things we ought to try to buy and what not by what they what types of industries um, government supports through tax write-offs and, and abatements and um, you know grants for research and all sorts of ways that government influences our economic life well I could go on but hopefully you get the point did you wear your seat belt today anyway in the modern story in the development of liberalism in particular Virtue is not supposed to be defined by government, as in, you know, this rebellion against the so-called nanny state, but instead it should be defined privately by the family, by institutions that are voluntarily attended, like the church or the synagogue or the mosque, and uh, most importantly by the individual who can think for himself um, and separate himself from these other entanglements to be, to be truly free. Good laws in the modern view then aim at peaceful and prosperous citizens and not necessarily perfectly virtuous citizens. Now there's something called bourgeois virtue and maybe I'll get into that in the, the third talk. Um, <clears throat> you know certain virtues are kind of automatically uh, encouraged because they are conducive to getting along with your fellow citizens and and good business but um, but the government does not have any special teaching you know I guess maybe to make this concrete you know for instance Plato's Republic elevates philosophers to the highest status if you want to be you want to be a totally actualized you know person you become as close to the philosophers as you as a, as you can and the laws would be put into play the laws that would be put into place would be laws that fostered as much of the philosophic um, nature as possible to get people to be as self-controlled as possible for instance um, in Sparta uh, the ideal human being was the warrior and you know the from the leadership and the laws and all the institutions that were developed um, were put into place to encourage that character which was considered ideal. Um, modern liberal governments do not claim to be promoting a particular kind of ideal person. They do not claim to be uh, defining what good character is. Now I think if you really think about it that that's not exactly true and I think this is where um, you know the argument for the ancient position is pretty strong um, the modern government one could argue promotes a certain type of character without expli explicitly saying so but anyway I digress I want to talk more about things like that probably next time but I wanted in the ending to talk about a couple of areas of misunderstanding on Strauss's position as I understand it. So one thing that uh, people sometimes charge Strauss, Strauss with is promoting a sort of anti-democratic uh, position. Um, Strauss is anti-democratic only in the sense that Plato was anti-democratic. He does not see democracy as the best possible regime. He sees a lot of faults with democracy. The chief fault with democracy is that the many rule and the many do not have the ability to see through the deceptive rhetoric of the uh, politicians that tend to prey upon their emotions. However, Plato provides a sort of backdoor defense of democracy by basically concluding that it's the best of the flawed regimes. In the Republic, he states that at least in democracies, a person can be relatively free. 
Many people go astray by pursuing whatever the heck they want at any given time. They kind of wander around willy-nilly through life, you know, trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong and what they want to do with themselves. But this relative freedom gives, gives the few who want to live the philosophic life um, the room to do so. Now, you know, Socrates was executed, right? Um, supposedly, he corrupted the youth and taught about false religion. Pa, when did that ever get anybody into trouble? Actually, they were just blaming somebody for their loss of the Peloponnesian War. But Socrates still loved Athens. And Plato, reflecting back on all that, was not willing to stop loving Athens either, and was actually able to write that democracy gave even people such as himself a better shot at freedom to do his thing than any other type of regime. And I think Strauss had that same admiration and appreciation for democracy. Um, he came here as an immigrant. He came to the United States from Germany. He was a German Jew who moved to the United States in 1937. I think you can understand why, why he would think kindly about American democracy. But yet he saw democracy as flawed. And in fact, I think he thought that the only way to really make the best of democracy was if people understood that it was not some sort of miracle cure for all problems, but rather a pretty problematic and constantly um, stumbling mess. It gave him a life, it gave him a place to do his thing for the rest of his career. So democracy was a mixed situation with both very good and very bad um, consequences. Only in that sense is Strauss anti-democratic. Strauss also has been criticized for his moral absolutism, which has started to come out in this discussion, this notion that you can use reason to discover that the truth, that the truth is out there. There is this universal truth that can be discovered by philosophic reason. Well, this also is true, but only in a sense. Um, Strauss's moral absolutism as so is Socratic, that is, he follows, follows the Socratic reasoning and agrees more or less that, that human beings make a terrible mess of life if they don't actually believe in moral absolutes and try to pursue them and find them and adhere to them through reason. Moral relativism can be very dangerous. Again, he um, lived through times in which one could see the consequences of extreme moral relativism, the sort of Nietzschean power grab of Nazism. But I say that Strauss's absolutism is Socratic because, as you're probably aware, Socrates said that he was considered by the oracle to be the wisest of all men. And when he, this was the oracle of Delphi, and when he puzzled about that with himself, he concluded that the reason why must be because he knew how little he knew. So Socrates had this teaching of intellectual humility, the idea that yes, you should seek the truth and reason could be used very well um, to, to seek it, but we are human beings. We don't have always complete information. Uh, there is always the chance that with different information, we might change our minds. We know that as human beings, life is a learning opportunity. What you think you know can be turned upside down by another person's argument or just by the facts as they present themselves. And so there is no rigidity in the so-called moral absolutism of either Strauss or Socrates. There is rather an objectivity about the human condition that perhaps we could all strive for, that is being able to see the human condition with clear eyes and understand that it's so very possible to be mistaken that we better hold judgment and make it conditional. 
All right, I will at least do one more, and I'll see you next week. Bye.